Good evening, everyone, and welcome back. We are Vets for Ukraine uh, 2022, and um, this is Vets for Ukraine 2022. So my name is Daniela Morgia, and I hope that many of you already know me and know already uh, what Vets for Ukraine 2022 is. Uh, we are a group of specialists. Uh, we are now uh, nearly 30 of us who decided to uh, put together our effort, efforts to um, collect some uh, donations to um, give to our brothers and sisters in difficulties in Ukraine. Um, we have decided to, uh, the only way we got at this moment to help um, our um, brother and sister is to uh, offer our specialty or our our knowledge uh, to help you um, uh, to help us to help them so we we are very delighted to share what we can do in the best way so our profession and the, therefore we have decided to organize webinars uh, which are um, free for all of you but in exchange of these actually um, webinars of high quality we are asking you to donate um, a little amount little amount because you know every little helps and we were thinking that on the Vetonia um, page on Facebook now we are more or less um, like 1200 people and we were just thinking if each of you could donate only one pound or one euro you can you can you can see what how much we would raise to to give to the uh, British Red Cross uh, to help people in Ukraine this is a difficult moment for these people um, they are exposed to uh, violence and um, injustice uh, many of them are fleeing their country they're leaving their home uh, they are losing the, the contacts with the family and they are losing the pets so they they don't have uh, uh, clean water, they don't have maybe a roof above their heads and they need to protect themselves, cover from it going into the basements to protect themselves from, from the bombs. So these people are really need uh, in need of our help and what we can do uh, is what we are doing now. So arranging uh, for you webinars to uh, spread uh, a bit of our knowledge uh, that could be useful for the everyday life in the general practice, but also to um, ask you to help us in raising, in raising um, uh, the donations. So now we have, I think this is, uh, I think this is the number 15 webinar that we are doing. And, and we thought to launch another initiative the new initiative that you can see in this slide is uh, like, like a marathon, so a three days marathon with 15 speakers. These are the 15 speakers that have spoken until now and that have presented their webinar until now. So we have 28 hours, 28 hours of free CPDs that you can access. They are recorded because we have already, we were already sorry we went live already with these speakers and with these webinars but because they are recorded you can access them uh, you can access them anytime on the vetonia uh, facebook group or on on youtube uh, but we are doing this initiative on the um, on the 8th of april 9th of april and 10th of april so uh friday saturday and sunday you have here all the Time. So the webinars will be automatically released one after the other, and you can watch them. You can watch all of them. You can watch the ones that you are interested um, um, more on. And but in exchange, we are asking you to uh, help us to help our brothers and sisters. So if you can, if you like to drink a coffee or if you like to drink a cafe latte, just uh, let's remind the appeal that uh, our colleague, Professor Stein uh, Nissen made some days ago, just uh, now is the time to not look away from the war. The war is behind the corner. Leave your cafe latte, leave your 
coffee, leave your beer, um, and just use uh, the amount of money that you would spend for uh, you know, a, a cafe latte or a coffee uh, or a beer, just donate it to us. Um, we are receiving many donations, but we, we need more. We need more, and this is why we are extending our program. So, and this is why more and more uh, lecturers, more and more webinars are going to organize. So we are now uh, looking into the future. We are going now until the end of May. And if I see uh, right, I think we will have more and more webinars for you. So please donate and don't forget to spread the word um, wide and far spread to your um, spread what we are doing spread the initiatives that we are doing um, i would like to remind you the initiative about uh, made your own t-shirt uh, i would like to remember you the our message in a bottle um, slides that we uh, do nearly every time um, and if you do not feel that you want to donate um, to vets for ukraine 2022 to help the british red cross you can still donate or try to help in a different way there are many ways to do that um, we have seen many examples but one that i'm thinking about now is the usava so the association of the, the ukrainian association of veterinarians and if you go and look for the usava page on facebook you will find many other possibilities to help um, people in ukraine so um now um i would like to introduce our speaker of today um it is a well-known and excellent cardiologist a veterinary cardiologist and uh, i think we have his light paolo No, I think, sorry, I'm going to have to go because um, I think I'm supposed to do some live. I'm sorry, I've got to go. Hi, um, thanks to uh, to everyone who's who's sharing all the uh, the links and the hashtags for our live stream, uh, which is coming up on Thursday, at 8 p.m. UK time, looking at atrial fibrillation in dogs. Please watch the webinar for free. It should be fun. There should be a good uh, number of people watching and um, hopefully we'll cover some important topics. But remember to make a donation to the DEC appeal via all the links uh, on Just Giving um, and try and promote this as best you can using the hashtag Vets for Ukraine 2022. Thanks to all the people on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook who are sharing it already. And um, I look forward to, to seeing and talking to you on Thursday. Take care. So atrial fibrillation in dogs, uh, bring order to cows and let's see if Kieran is with us now. Hello there. Hi Kieran, welcome. How are you? How are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Not too bad. Uh, always strange watching a video of yourself talking, but... <laughs> mm, yeah, you can get used to it. So I cannot avoid to appreciate the, the nice t-shirt you have got, yeah? With Thank you very much. Yeah, I'd like to claim it was made, but it's not homemade by uh, by me no, anyway. Okay. Oh, I try my best as well. You see yellow and uh, yellow and, and blue to uh, remind the uh, Ukrainian flag. Yeah, so, you're my inspiration for my outfit this evening. Oh, thank you. So, Kiran, do you want to, um, I think it's much better if you introduce yourself because you can tell us about you. Uh, you and I, we met some time ago. in, in Oh, about, about 10,000 years ago, wasn't it? When uh, I was I'm not that old, yeah. Kiran, come on. <laughs> and you are not that old either. So it's just uh, <laughs> six years ago, something like that. So, and, and I remember if I can just tell um, our friends. So I remember that we... Uh, we did together, so you did it, and I was helping um, a, a chemo embolization. Oh, yeah, I remember very well, actually. A lovely oh, Labrador. Yeah. 
on a Patek Mas in a Labrador. And I remember, I think you were also a bit cross with me because for some reason, <laughs> I somehow, I, I, I don't know, the, the, the arterial access was a little bit doomed and you were very upset with me. But anyway. I so. wasn't. Well, I wasn't very <laughs> upset. I, um, you know what? I tell my residents now, if they, uh, if they put the needle through the vessel, I say, look, it's all right. Even these amazing surgeons, they do it as well, you know. Exactly. I'm sure you were, you are thinking at me when you when you are saying that. <laughs> I am, but you know that's okay. You know, it's, it's good. It's good. So okay, so Kira, you are uh, at, in Bristol at the vet school. Do you want correct, to tell yeah. us about what you do, mm. the beautiful things that you do? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> my name's Kieran. I um, I work ninety uh, percent in clinics in cardiology at, at Langford Vet, the University of Bristol. Um, so I have ten percent of my time for things like writing lectures and, and speaking and giving CPD and doing research. Um, but I, I I don't want to pretend to be a real university vet because I'm not an academic. I'm never going to publish that amazing groundbreaking research that uh, that some of my colleagues will. Um, but uh, I, I like my clinical role. We get to see lots of patients. I get to train some fantastic residents. Work with some amazing students as well. Um, so it's a it's a great job. Um, and uh, I've been working uh, in just cardiology practice now for just over ten years. I uh, did my residency at the Royal Vet College in London, um, and I'm ACBIM, ECBIM boarded. Um, we do quite a lot of interventional procedures, so I quite like the interventional surgery aspect, hence our <laughs> shared history of, uh, of, of chemo embolization and, and procedures like that. Um, and uh, I work um, very closely with the surgeons at Langford, and we do a lot of intrahepatic shunts. Uh, we do some respiratory stenting um, and, and all sorts of cardiac surgery as well. So um, it's it's a, a really nice role because I get that that owner contact, that um, that time spending time with the animals, with our patients, which, which is great. But I have got a little more flexible time. I've got access to these amazing tools, so I'm very privileged in my job. And uh, you know, I enjoy I it a lot. I you a lot. I would like to. <laughs> I would like to be where you are, Kiran. Oh, yeah. uh, Paulo says that um, there is a surprise for you. We have received. Yeah like a, a movie or a video, a video record, uh, so a video message. And if you okay. agree, um, we we would like to see it together, yeah? Look, I mean, I'm going to agree because uh, how yeah, bad can it be? <laughs> but before doing that, let me, let me just launch the sharing countdown because we want I'm, to reach as many, yeah? You say? I'm just going to write down who I think it's going to be and yeah. then I'll share that with you afterwards, okay? Uh, but maybe Paolo has spoiled it already because, you know... No, Paolo he hasn't, has, but I'm so... just making a prediction. I'm just making That's a prediction. Good. Okay, okay. But before this, Paolo, can you please send a countdown sharing because we want to reach as many people as possible because we want to raise as much as money as possible for the, these global calls. Here we are. So let's have a look at the surprise. Hello, Daniela and team of the Vets for Ukraine 2022. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to participate, although very briefly, to this great initiative in support of our Ukrainian colleagues. And first of all, I would like to send my personal greetings and uh, words of solidarity to all my friends in Ukraine. This spring I was actually supposed to speak about feline cardiology at a meeting in Kiev and uh, when I was invited a few months ago nobody could have uh, ever, uh, even imagined that this tragedy would have happened in uh, such a beautiful country full of history and wonderful people. I'm constantly in touch with uh, many Ukrainian colleagues and uh, follow their personal heartbreaking stories. Fortunately they're all safe although most of them were forced to leave their homes, in some cases even leaving their families behind, to find shelter in neighboring countries like uh, Romania, Poland, Germany, Estonia, and so on. 
I would just like to take this opportunity to send them all my um, my love and uh, positive vibes. And I look forward to seeing a free Ukraine again very soon. Now I have the also the great pleasure to introduce the um, speaker of the evening, Dr. Kieran Borget. Kieran was one of my vet students when I was a lecturer in cardiology at the vet school at the University of Bristol. And 15 years later, Kieran has become a lecturer in cardiology at the University of Bristol, exactly the same place where I had the pleasure to teach him cardiology. Kieran has always been a, a very keen student and colleague, but also a fun person to work with. Very intelligent, uh, very um, pleasant, and, uh, and I'm not sure whether I have somehow inspired Kieran to become a cardiologist, but I'd like to believe so. Indeed, Kieran and I have always stayed in touch over the years, exchanging experience, um, ideas, doing challenging interventions together, and participating in uh, clinical research. Furthermore, Kieran um, and I share some strong, some strong professional interest like uh, feline cardiology, interventional cardiology, for example. And another topic we worked with together was uh, atrial fibrillation, which is the title of his presentation tonight. And I was privileged to have contributed to his uh, recent publication on uh, the prevalence of sudden cardiac death in dogs with uh, atrial fibrillation, which was published in the Journal of Atrial Internal Medicine, uh, Medicine just uh, a few months ago. I'm very sorry that this is a pre-recorded introduction here, but it was a last minute invitation and I had already a commitment for this evening. However, knowing very well your uh, presentation style, I'm sure it will be another superb, captivating and thought-provoking lecture, which every, everyone will terribly enjoy. I will certainly um, follow the recorded version as soon as it as soon as it becomes available on uh, YouTube. And um, now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Kieran Borget at Vets for Ukraine 2022. And thank you very much. Enjoy. <laughs> so you knew that. Your, the, your microphone is off. Yeah. I knew it would be Luca. I knew it would be Luca. Yeah. I, uh, when you said we have a special guest, I thought, it has to be him. He, he um, well, thank you, Luca, if you do watch this. Uh, you won't learn anything in the lecture, I don't think. Um, but uh, he, he has been a, a fantastic colleague um, and, you know, a real, a real inspiration over the years, actually. Uh, you know, from when I was in practice and uh, a, a few, you know, myself and some, some peers were, were studying for our certificate in veterinary cardiology. And, uh, and Luca gave us some training. You know, he invited us to his house and we, we had dinner, we had some training, we read book club, we, we did all sorts of things as if we were residents. Um, so actually, you know, he's always been incredibly supportive over the years. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's nice now to, to sort of work with him as a colleague, uh, you know, and, and still a student, I think. So, yes, so thank you, Luca Ferrazin. And um, we will have him also uh, among, so he is among our, our speakers, and he will uh, be soon with us as well with one of his topics. Before, before uh, starting with your webinar, Kiran, um, I was thinking because I have seen that you have a nice group on Instagram called, uh, I think it's called Vet Cardio. Um, oh, yeah, sure. And, and, I, 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 I'm not really sure what, what is it. What do you want to 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 explain me? What to us? What what is it that carry? You have loads of followers. I think nine thousand followers, which is yeah. There, there, are, there are nine thousand crazy people out there who are, who are uh, uh, maybe <laughs> interested. In... No, so they, <laughs> it means that they follow you and they like you. So and you. Well. That they may be as interested in uh, veterinary cardiology as I am, um, and yeah, it's just a, a little um, sort of educational account, really, um, where I just share some pictures, some videos, some some you know stories, um, and I think of it as like very very small bites of uh, of CPD or, or CE um, for vets, for nurses, for students. Um, so yeah, it's great. I, I'm really. Um, I really like having having uh, you know a wide number of followers from all over the world yeah. because I've learned I've learned things from them and and um, you know I see these fantastic 
um, veterinarians performing these amazing cardiac procedures and dealing with these very complicated cases in, you know, in South Korea, in Brazil, you know, all over the world. And, um, you know, it's, it's really, it's really inspirational for me to see the work that vets all over the world are putting into to cardiac cases. Um, and, you know, it's a nice way of, of sort of meeting people, I guess, and staying in touch with people. Um, it's good. So, um, yeah, and I don't make any money out of it. So there's no conflict of interest or anything. Um, it's just, it's just for fun and, uh, and, and education. I think it's amazing what you do. You oh, know. Thank you. You're kind. Yeah. And I'm very, I'm very, you know, honored to have you here with us. Thank you for accepting to, um, to, to talk for us and with us and supporting us. And just one last thing is uh, before you start is uh, we have a slide uh, to for the sensitive contents just to make everyone sure that whatever you will see in our webinars uh, it is done with the consent of the pets owners uh, there is no uh, to what we are showing there is no suffering so uh, it's, everything is in a, done in a very ethical they are clinical cases we have consent for for everything we do um, the photo sometimes can be a little bit upsetting so uh, just a warning for people that might uh, get upset seeing you know, uh, blood or things like that. I'm talking about more surgery uh, photos. Um, so just uh, be careful just under this point of view. Um, yes, I think we are ready. We are actually, we are right. many, there are many uh, people following you, Kiran. So congratulations. Oh, well, this. hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll do a good job. Um, we'll, you we'll will. You will. <laughs> we are pretty sure. Okay, I think I, I'll let you start and good Great. luck. Um, enjoy, Kiran. Bojic. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Great. I shall, I'll shall. i start my presentation now. Yeah. Um, I'll let you and... see. see and <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, perfect. You can go. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Daniela. Um, yeah, so. And thank you to, to everybody who's um, who's watching, whether it's live or, or uh, recorded um, over the weekend. I, don't forget, um, please do make a donation. It's just something very small, even to um, the Vets for Ukraine Just Giving page, because that money will go uh, direct to the DEC um, appeal uh, for the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine. I think, after all. Um, this is over and it will be over um at some point but i think after all this is over we should all try to remember that humanitarian crises in europe are not the only humanitarian crises they do occur all over the world all the time sadly and, and there's always something more that we can do as fellow humans to try and um make a difference uh, everywhere not just in the ukraine but tonight we're going to focus on the ukraine and, uh, and thank you all for uh, for tuning in Let's, so, let's, remind, let's remind them, the, sorry, where to click. So we have www.justgiving.com slash vets for Ukraine. So click on the link and make your donation. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. And I will share <laughs> that on my Instagram as well. And I know it's, it's widely shared on, on, on LinkedIn and Facebook. So, um, okay, atrial fibrillation in dogs. It's a very common arrhythmia. We have probably all seen it as vets. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take a, a safari through different points of view on atrial fibrillation um, and how we might be able to, to treat those dogs and bring order to the chaos. So the lecture aims. Um, we're going to think uh, initially a short introduction about atrial fibrillation and then we're going to think about the controversy of isolated AF in dogs. Can dogs have atrial fibrillation without having cardiomyopathy or other structural heart disease? We're going to think about techniques for converting dogs back into sinus rhythm from being in atrial fibrillation. There are some patients who are suitable for this and we can see very good success rates if we choose the right candidates. And we're gonna think about treating these dogs using rate control. If they have significant underlying primary cardiac disease, then converting them back to sinus rhythm may not be a long-term um, gain. So rate control drugs and antiarrhythmic drugs are probably the best strategy for those animals. So atrial fibrillation, it can do bad things. This is a uh, five or six year old dog de Bordeaux who I saw many years ago now. Um, and you can see this dog has got abdominal distension, very severe cachexia. Uh, so this is a dog with advanced signs of right-sided heart failure. And his primary problem was severe 
out of control atrial fibrillation. So in this condition, we have chaotic activity in the atria driven by lots of small electrical circuits, which means that we do not have normal atrial uh, contraction. Now that will reduce cardiac output because if we don't fill the ventricles from the atria immediately before systole, that reduces cardiac output by approximately 20%. And at exercise, when systemic vascular resistance reduces, heart rate increases, and output should increase, in cases with atrial fibrillation, their output can't increase so much in terms of stroke volume, their heart rate increases very rapidly, and therefore they can't cope with exercise very well. At rest, patients with atrial fibrillation may cope just fine. And it's commonly associated with atrial dilation, fibrosis, heart disease, which is causing uh, the atria to stretch and conduct abnormally. On physical exam, we will detect a highly irregular heart rhythm, a chaotic irregularity with no pattern. So there should be no mistaking this for sinus arrhythmia. In the schematic here, we can see <clears throat> I've demonstrated these small arrows to try and identify that there are many small, irregular, chaotic, non-ordinated wave fronts of electrical activity passing through the atria. So these bombard the AV node, they, they hit the AV node at approximately five to 600 impulses per minute. Now that means the AV node is your lifesaver if you have atrial fibrillation. It stops all of those being conducted because that would not be compatible with life. And what it does is slow the heart rate down to a more reasonable level. So the AV node is our control point. That's the hero of atrial fibrillation. And that's something that we can try and um, use drugs to control. How might we see atrial fibrillation on an ECG? Well, here we've got a nice example of atrial fibrillation with a fairly fast heart rate. One of the key things is there's a lack of P waves. So we do not see that consistent positive deflection prior to the QRS complex. A huge feature is the highly irregular RR intervals. So that rate is highly irregular throughout the ECG. And if the rate is quite fast, you may not be able to see how irregular it is. So in those cases, I will count the number of millimeters between the complexes, and often you identify that even though you may have thought it was pretty regular at first, when you count the number of millimeters, you realize no two RR intervals are the same. And of course, there's a fibrillatory baseline. So these are fine undulations of the baseline which reflect those tiny electrical circuits that are transitioning around the atria. So we may have coarse uh, circuits, so larger circuits which cause coarse atrial fibrillation, or we may have very fine atrial fibrillation. If we put the filter on the ECG, which is a default setting for many people to make the ECG look nicer, we can filter these out. So if you need the filter because of your ECG machine or interference in your practice, that's fine, but just be aware that you may not see the fibrillatory baseline very clearly. In the example here, we can see it quite nicely. Duration of AF is quite important. Now, I think maybe a decade ago, when I was just really beginning to specialise in cardiology, I thought that most dogs that we saw as veterinary cardiologists presented with permanent atrial fibrillation. But that's not true. There are three different types of atrial fibrillation. There's paroxysmal, which is episodes of atrial fibrillation that are self-limiting. The dog converts back into sinus rhythm. Persistent, with persistent atrial fibrillation, it doesn't self-convert, but we can give drugs or perform a procedure to reset that dog's rhythm to sinus and it will hold in sinus rhythm. Or there's permanent atrial fibrillation. And permanent AF is long-term atrial fibrillation, which is either unsuitable for cardioversion, where there's no point in us performing it, such as a dog with a huge atrial dilation caused by severe degenerative mitral valve disease, or a patient where we try to cardiovert them into, into sinus, and they've either reverted to atrial fibrillation or they've um, gone into sinus and then gone back into AF after the procedure. Paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, I think we most commonly encounter it after pericardiosynthesis. So if we imagine a case with a pericardial effusion, the atria are somewhat compressed by the effusion, we rapidly drain the pericardial effusion, um, which is good for the dog, it improves cardiac output, but the atria rapidly fill and stretch. 
And that rapid stretching can lead to changes in the electrical activity which cause atrial fibrillation. Sometimes these dogs will just self-convert without us doing anything at all. Sometimes we do something and we tell ourselves it's helped, but I think oftentimes they would have just gone back into sinus rhythm anyway. Paroxysmal atrial fibrillation in my clinic is sometimes identified in dogs with structural heart disease, but in the clinic they might have sinus rhythm. If we put a 24-hour halter ECG on them to look at the electrical activity of the heart in the home environment, it's not uncommon to find short bursts of atrial fibrillation in dogs with significant atrial dilation. The third kind is uh, atrial fibrillation induced by general anesthesia. So this can be uh, caused by a combination of vagotonic drugs, opiates, things like that. Um, and uh, that increases the heterogeneity so that the differences in the atrial refractory period of the atrial electrogram or, or action potential. That promotes small circuits forming. And if we combine that high vagal tone induced by opiates with abdominal surgery, which again will increase vagal tone, then that's something that can potentially trigger AF. I think sometimes uh, there are other risk factors such as aseptic focus, um, being hypovolemic, various other things that may cause autonomic imbalance. So high vagal tone because of what you're doing and high sympathetic tone because of the animal's pathology. So here's a case of paroxysmal AF on a halter. I just analyzed this uh, early this week, actually, and this was a dog with severe mitral valve disease. Um, and we can see uh, at the top left, I'm just gonna get my mouse pointer so you can see the, or my laser pointer so you can see the, the screen. This is a dog with sinus rhythm at the top left of the trace. We have a P wave, QRS, T, P, QRS, T. And then we do have a QRS here that doesn't have a P wave in front of it and an atrial premature complex. And then a couple more sinus beats, and then suddenly the rhythm becomes highly irregular, the baseline becomes fibrillatory, and there are no discernible P waves. So this dog is in atrial fibrillation, and you see the difference in the baseline between here and here. Now, there was 38 seconds of atrial fibrillation. This is about five past one in the morning, and then suddenly the dog goes back into sinus rhythm again. So we can see the baseline normalizes, and we have a PQRST morphology. There was no indication in clinic this dog had atrial fibrillation. There was no reason to suspect it was, it was occurring. We actually put a halter on because of some atrial premature complexes and found this. So this is an interesting case, and I don't think he's the only dog out there with paroxysmal AF. Although unless we're doing ECGs in the home environment, we're not going to find that. Here's another dog that I saw last week. This is a fantastic case referred by a, a great friend of mine, Sean, um, who runs a practice locally. And he's a, a very good vet, much better than I used to be in general practice. And he did a proper full pre-anesthetic exam. Heart rate was 80 beats a minute with a sinus arrhythmia on ECG. And then here's a video he sent me. We can see this dog went into atrial fibrillation under the um, anesthetic. So this is a dog with pyometra, so septic, maybe a little hypovolemic. Um, we've got opiates on board. We've got abdominal surgery. It's the perfect rest developing atrial fibrillation. So what did we do? Well, we saw this dog and we managed to successfully cardiovert the dog um, because there was a normal echo, normal blood work, and we attempted electrical cardioversion and we managed to restore sinus rhythm. So this is the video of it happening and you can see us applying a shock. We'll talk more about this shortly. But we end up with a regular rhythm, a little tachycardic, but regular with a PQRS morphology. So it is possible to convert these dogs. So that was one paroxysmal AF, one persistent AF, and we're gonna talk a bit more about permanent atrial fibrillation as we go. So what can cause atrial fibrillation? Well, as I said, it can be triggered, pericardiocentesis, anesthesia, electrolyte abnormalities, high vagal tone, etc. Most commonly we see it secondary to structural heart disease. In dogs, mitral valve disease is the biggie. Dilated cardiomyopathy, we also will see atrial fibrillation, especially in uh, Irish Wolfhounds, Dobermans, Newfoundlands, the larger dogs. And we do see it in feline cardiomyopathy. I won't talk more about cats, but in cats with very severe atri atrial dilation, that is a, a risk factor for um, atrial fibrillation. We may see dogs who have atrial fibrillation with no apparent underlying cause, and they tend to be the large or giant breed dogs and they will have a normal echo at the time of diagnosis. So why are we bothered about AF? I've already said that we have a reduced stroke volume, 
which means cardiac output is reduced. They're much more heart rate dependent. That leads to a persistent tachycardia in many cases. And if the heart rate is very uncontrolled, becomes very high, then we can end up with tachycardia induced myocardial dysfunction. They can look just like dilated cardiomyopathy. And this is a reversible condition when we control the heart rate successfully. The chaotic irregularity of atrial fibrillation, irrespective of rate, promotes systolic dysfunction and dilation of the ventricles. So the irregularity promotes heart disease, which eventually could lead to heart failure, even if there was no heart disease causing the atrial fibrillation. We know from experimental studies on dogs <coughs> from the 60s, 70s, 80s, being in atrial fibrillation increases the prevalence of ventricular arrhythmias. Ventricular arrhythmias can be problematic because they will again contribute to a reduction in output, but also they can cause sudden cardiac death if they are timed badly. And finally, as Luca uh, very kindly said in the introduction to this talk, um, we have published a paper relatively recently which shows an association between atrial fibrillation and an increased risk of sudden cardiac death in dogs. This is true in humans as well. One thing they do worry about in humans that we don't really need to worry about in dogs is thrombotic complications. In humans, being in atrial fibrillation is a massive risk factor for developing thrombogenic stroke. Nobody wants to lose function. Uh, no one wants to have neurological compromise. Stroke is an incredibly bad thing. In humans, if you develop atrial fibrillation, they will immediately give you anti-thrombotic drugs to reduce your risk of thrombogenic stroke. There is good data out there from models in dogs to suggest that atrial fibrillation and changes to the structure of the cell, changes to the electrical structure of the heart, does not promote thrombus formation in dogs. So that's very interesting, very different to humans. Obviously, species are different to one another. There is a case report out there from the Journal of Veterinary Cardiology, which reported thrombotic complications associated with AF in three dogs. I've seen one case in a very large dog de Bordeaux with a very um, uh, intense tachycardia, uh, over 300 beats a minute in the clinic. Um, and one of my colleagues has also reported seeing an intraatrial thrombus in a dog with atrial fibrillation. The fact that we remember these cases means they are rare. We see lots of AF, and I've seen one dog with an intracardiac thrombus. Tachycardiomyopathy, this is the rate dependent remodeling of the heart. This occurs and leads to a, an appearance like DCM with an inappropriately high heart rate over weeks or months. So we, we get this situation sometimes where we see a dog with atrial fibrillation and fast heart rate, and we don't know if they have heart disease to start with or if the AF has caused them to get heart disease. It's chicken or egg. We don't know which came first. So it's a retrospective diagnosis. We have to treat them, we have to control the heart rate as best we can, and we assess what happens to them. So it can be entirely reversible, not if you're late to diagnosis, but if you can get in there early, we can see the heart normalize and they lose the DCM phenotype. Here's a, a great example. Um, it was a case that was seen sort of mid lockdowns in the UK um, back in October 2020. The dog presented with um, atrial fibrillation and very poor rate control in clinic. The dog had, uh, had really marked congestive heart failure signs with pulmonary edema and some ascites as well, so bilateral heart failure. And on echo had a DCM phenotype. Here's the echo. Um, for any of you unfamiliar with looking at echo, we can see we have the left atrium here, mitral valve, left ventricle, and the right heart over here, which is disproportionately large looking. Uh, and the left atrium looks quite large compared to the ventricle. The function doesn't look great. Doesn't look like a classic DCM, but I think, you know, we were concerned this dog had primary myocardial disease. You can tell how bad the congestive heart failure is because there is a small pericardial effusion just here. You can see the dog had a lot of mitral regurgitation. The green on the color flow Doppler suggests there's mitral regurgitation there. And this is a, a short axis view of the heart at the heart base. We have the aortic root in the middle. You see the three leaf clover of the aortic valve. And we can see the left atrium here with the left oracle. This left atrium should not be more than 1.5 times the diameter of the aorta, which would come to about here. 
and actually it is larger than that. So there's left atrial dilation. I think this is probably an underestimate of left atrial size in this image. So we couldn't get the heart failure under control very well. We um, treated with frozen and pimibendum because we, that's how we would treat systolic dysfunction and congestive heart failure. And because the heart rate was very high persistently during the hospitalization period, we decided we would treat with diltiazem to try and control the heart rate. So we went for a dose of approximately three milligrams per kilo twice a day. And we said to the owner, come back in two weeks, we're gonna put a 24 hour ECG on and see what the home heart rate is. The last two years have been crazy for everybody. And uh, the owner forgot, we forgot, the dog did great. And they came back one and a half years later. So this was only a few weeks back. Um, so the lovely Labrador presented and we said, wow, he's still alive with his DCM and his AF. Uh, the owner said he'd never been better. Fantastic. So we laid our hands on him. We repeated an echo and we did a halter. That's his echo now. And I think you can all appreciate the difference in the cardiac chamber size, the function, the atrial size relative to the ventricle in this follow-up echo. He doesn't have significant mitral regurgitation anymore. And the left atrium is normal in size. So this dog has a retrospective diagnosis of a tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. This is his halter heart rate. This is one of the, the measures of heart rate we get on a halter. And you can see here, although it's quite high when he's in the clinic and he's going home, that's because he's so excited to see his owner, then actually his average heart rates at home are quite nice and low which is good. A lot of the day is spent below 100 beats a minute, which is ideal. So we got really great rate control on this dog and his signs reversed, which is really amazing. We didn't know at the time. I don't think you can. I think you have to treat them and reassess what happens. So another problem in atrial fibrillation is sudden cardiac death. And this is relatively new data. Um, it's a retrospective study that uh, I coordinated across a number of different um, cardiology referral centers in the UK. Um, so we, we took a retrospective population of 142 dogs with atrial fibrillation and we compared them to a control group of 127 dogs with sinus rhythm. The groups were matched for the types of heart disease. The problem with AF is if you have a load of dogs with uh, very severe DCM and then in sinus rhythm you have uh, some dogs with very mild mitral valve disease, you're comparing apples and oranges. So we had to match them um, to be the same at the baseline. So there's no significant difference in the age of these dogs, uh, the sex, the proportion of dogs with ventricular arrhythmias was the same in both populations as well. And we found that just the presence of atrial fibrillation was associated with a significantly increased prevalence of sudden cardiac death. So they, these are the numbers. It was approximately 15% of dogs with atrial fibrillation suffered sudden cardiac death and approximately 6% uh, in the sinus rhythm group suffered sudden cardiac death. So being in sinus rhythm does not protect you from dropping dead if you're a dog with heart disease, but being in AF makes it more likely to happen. We did some statistical analysis to look at the factors associated with uh, the occurrence of sudden cardiac death in dogs with AF. If they were younger at diagnosis, they were more likely to drop dead. Maybe they just lived for long enough to do it. Um, if they had a larger left atrial size, they were more likely to die uh, suddenly. That makes sense to me because these are dogs with worse heart disease. But interestingly, a history of syncope uh, was associated with an increased prevalence of sudden cardiac death. So that's interesting because maybe these dogs are having either ventricular arrhythmias or maybe even brady arrhythmias after fast atrial fibrillation. They can sometimes brady down. Maybe that's why they're syncopal, and maybe that's a clue as to the pathophysiology of why they're dying suddenly. So I think we'd all agree, based on this, AF is bad. So we're going to move on to thinking about the controversy of isolated atrial fibrillation in dogs. Is it possible to have isolated AF? This was a, a nice uh, retrospective study on a AF by uh, Pierre Manot and, uh, and colleagues looking at um, 109 dogs with, uh, with structural or functional cardiac disease, or rather, sorry, with or without cardiac disease. There was a significant difference in survival time between dogs who had heart disease and the dogs who didn't have apparent heart disease. So we can see here that the survival time of dogs with heart disease and atrial fibrillation was less than 12 months. The survival time on average of dogs with no heart disease was over 
three to four, well, three, three and a half years. This is a, a significant amount of, uh, of time. So maybe the dogs without heart disease just have atrial fibrillation and they can do very well. So is there such a thing as AF without heart disease? So we would call a dog isolated AF if they have no overt disease detectable on their echo. So the irregularity can make it challenging, but we would say that everything measures normal on the echo. There's no dilation, there's no dysfunction. Now, is it really that <coughs> they have a healthy heart or is this an early form of cardiomyopathy? There must be something that triggers the AF. Maybe they've got such early DCM that it's occurring on a cellular level and we can't see what's happening with the echo. And as I said before, the irregularity of rhythm itself can contribute to the development of dysfunction. So maybe they were healthy and now you're measuring them, they're equivocal, perhaps that's just the irregularity. There's some interesting data on Irish wolfhounds. Um, Andrea and uh, Christine Volmar have, uh, have studied uh, wolfhounds with a huge amount of dedication over the last, um, well, Andrea's been studying for 10, 20 years. Um, and they are looking at, at uh, atrial fibrillation in dogs and what the echo shows, what happens over time to these dogs. Um, and, you know, it's a huge undertaking. So this retrospective uh, longitudinal study looked at 52 Irish wolfhounds with atrial fibrillation. So what they mean by subclinical is this was an incidental finding. They had no signs of heart failure, no syncope. It was just an incidental finding that they were in AF. They also did not have any echo abnormalities at the beginning. Over time, 50% of dogs with AF developed DCM. Comparing that to a control group of dogs with sinus rhythm, it was a significant difference. So atrial fibrillation seemed to lead to DCM in these cases, or maybe DCM was present underlying in 50% of dogs. So half of the atrial fibrillation dogs died for non-cardiac reasons. That suggests that some dogs either have a truly isolated AF and actually have quite a good prognosis, or in half of dogs with AF, 50%, sorry, in half of dogs with AF, they will go on to develop cardiomyopathy or signs of cardiomyopathy, maybe caused by the irregularity. We don't know, is the answer, whether AF is a primary arrhythmia in some dogs or not. We know that larger breed dogs seem to have a predisposition to supraventricular arrhythmias. So we see um, uh, mastiffs, um, wolfhounds, deerhounds, who have frequent atrial premature complexes or atrial tachycardias. And perhaps this leads to the formation of ectopic atrial circuits in the heart, which trigger atrial fibrillation. There is evidence of ectopic atrial activity in pulmonary veins in some humans, and we know that atrial flutter circuits in the right atrium occur, again, in large breed dogs. Both of these can, occur, can contribute to atrial fibrillation. So Mastiffs, Newfoundlands, Dr. Bordeaux, Irish Wolfhound, other dogs like this, large uh, dogs with large hearts can potentially develop AF because of these um, supraventricular arrhythmias. I was involved in a, a retrospective report looking at um, describing Dr. Bordeaux cardiomyopathy. Um, and basically the data from this population of Dr. Bordeaux in the UK suggested that perhaps a supraventricular arrhythmia was the inciting factor in DCM. So maybe they developed supraventricular tachycardia or atrial fibrillation and then went on to get the DCM eventually. So if we did see a dog with what we believe is isolated atrial fibrillation or at the time what we believe is isolated atrial fibrillation, what can we do? Can we cardiovert them, restore sinus rhythm? We know why we want to treat atrial fibrillation. If they're particularly tachycardic based on either the halter in the home environment <coughs> or ECG in clinic, or if they've got clinical signs uh, that are difficult to control, especially if they've got signs of right-sided heart failure, or if you expect athletic performance. Not many of our patients are athletes, not truly. Um, even working dogs often sit still for a long time and then retrieve. But if we've got a dog who it wants to be exercising with the owner, or a, a dog who's working on a farm, say a cattle dog or a sheep dog. What are our 
treatment strategies for these patients? Well, we could try and return their heart rhythm to sinus rhythm. We'll talk about that now. We've got medical cardioversion or electrical cardioversion as our option. The backup for these dogs, if that failed, would be heart rate control. This would be our first line in dogs with significant heart disease. This is where we give drugs to reduce the conduction of impulses from the atria through the AV node. So they're still in atrial fibrillation. We're not aiming to restore normal atrial activity, but we're aiming to use the AV node as a control point with digoxin, diltiazem, or other uh, negatively chronotropic drugs like atenolol, sotalol, amiodarone. Cardioversion can be performed medically. It's a pharmacologic or medical cardioversion. This is best uh, used in dogs with acute atrial fibrillation. Maybe these are the anesthesia associated um, cases. This is always my first line with an acute AF is to treat them with intravenous lidocaine. Now lidocaine is cheap, it's widely available. The other drugs here, procainamine, quinidine, they're the same class of antiarrhythmic as lidocaine but they're much more expensive and harder to get hold of. So you don't want to keep a large stock on your shelf because they're likely to go out of date. So the data backing up lidocaine use for acute AF is based on a small population of German Shepherd dogs. It doesn't tend to fit well with our population I've seen in the last 12 months. Anesthesia associated AF in a, um, a Russian Terrier, uh, in a Greyhound and a Labrador Retriever. I don't think I've ever seen one in a German Shepherd, or at least not recently. With chronic atrial fibrillation, there is data to support the use of class three antiarrhythmics such as amiodarone to try and restore sinus rhythm. It's rarely successful. The only time that we would ever use that um, with atrial fibrillation would be if we were planning uh, a, an electrical cardioversion um, and we wanted to treat them for a couple of weeks beforehand. Why would we do that? Some people say that that improves the likelihood or increases the likelihood of them getting back into sinus rhythm with the electrical cardioversion. I don't know how I feel about that. The data on it is very mixed. However, if we do that, we're using a couple of weeks to treat them with the drug before we perform the procedure. The difficulty is a shorter duration of AF before cardioversion means you're gonna be more successful. So if it is acute or if you know when they went into AF, for example, the dog presented with AF and last week they became very quiet and exercise intolerant. I wouldn't waste the time with the amiodarone. I would just go straight for electrical cardioversion. So this is uh, what we do for dogs with electrical cardioversion. They have to be anesthetized and we place them somewhere low down because they're large breed dogs. We put them on a, a comfortable mattress on the floor because they're gonna get a lot of uh, limb and muscle motion during the cardioversion. So we apply an electrical current across the atria, well, across the thorax, because it's transthoracic in these cases. And the aim is we just reset the action potential in all the cells of the heart at the same time. So all these micro circuits of re-entry of electricity within the atria just stop. And hopefully the sinus node comes back in and takes over at the correct time. All right, I'm gonna shut. So you can see here, the video on the right, this dog's receiving a shock. Uh, under anesthesia for good reason, as you see. If you watch now. It's quite dramatic, and if you're not expecting it, it can give you a sharp intake of breath. But this was a successful cardioversion in this dog post anesthesia induced AF. You see, sometimes the patient is very large that we do. This is a Great Dane undergoing electrical cardioversion. I think around 90% of cases that we perform convert to normal sinus rhythm. That's good but we choose our cases carefully. We do not try to convert dogs who've got underlying heart disease. And a high proportion of the ones that we cardiovert, I think 40 to 50%, will go back into atrial fibrillation within the first four weeks. Now, we know historically that's much more likely if there's structural heart disease present. We won't try a second cardioversion. We'll do one, and if it's successful, but they come back with AF, we will then call it quits and not repeat the procedure. So there are some data out there on transthoracic cardioversion of AF in dogs. Um, a, a group from um, the US, uh, it's quite a, an elderly paper now, I guess, 2005. Um, of 39 dogs where this was attempted, 36 returned, uh, had a return of sinus rhythm. And those without structural heart disease retained sinus rhythm for longer. So look at the difference. No heart disease, 690 days, versus 73 for heart disease. 
which is why we don't do it in dogs with structural heart disease. We don't think it's appropriate. In this population, there was no effect of pre-treatment with amiodarone. We just do it, it's sort of like folklore. I guess it makes us feel better that we've done everything we can because we're gonna give them one chance with the cardioversion. And again, as I said, we wouldn't do that and waste our time doing it if the dog was pretty acute. Because if it was, we know that getting in there sooner is gonna lead to a better outcome. That's based on this paper, again from Jan Bright, looking at AF um, and how the longer a dog is in AF before cardioversion, the less likely they are to have restoration of this rhythm. So as soon as we can, we will go for it in a dog with known atrial fibrillation. The data from this population suggested 70% of dogs in AF for less than 75 days retain sinus rhythm for more than 100 days. So basically, the sooner you get in there, the better the long-term outcome. In some very large dogs where they've got a broad chest, we will perform a procedure called transvenous electrical cardioversion. So this is where we will use fluoroscopy, you can see the moving x-ray in the middle, to pass catheters around into the pulmonary vein for one and the cranial vena cava right atrial border for the other. And that will just um, focus that electrical impulse across the atria so it doesn't get dissipated through the musculature of the thorax and the limbs. What happens in these cases is quite dramatic sometimes um, because obviously we give the shock and they're draped up in theatre. So you can't actually see the, uh, the video here, it's not working for some reason, but on the right here, this is the dog draped up and you can imagine that dog receiving its shock under the drapes. So you have to be quite careful that you've got everything attached to the table very well. That procedure is based on the procedure in horses um, and we do that in horses uh, in conjunction with colleagues um, in equine medicine and uh, we perform this mostly using ultrasound guidance in horses um, and here's what happens to a horse. You see the fibrillatory baseline, the irregular rhythm. and the restoration of sinus with a PQRS morphology. Excuse the dodgy cinematography from me. So we can see a normal ECG there with successful cardioversion. This is the same thing from a dog. We can see the ECG on the left is irregular. There's an undulating baseline. And then we have a shock delivered, timed on the R wave of the QRS complex. And then there's a couple of premature beats with slightly abnormal morphology. And then we have restoration of PQRS. Doesn't always work. Here's a case, slightly terror inducing at the time. We can see here we've got atrial fibrillation. We shock, again synchronized on the R wave. And then we have a normal beat maybe. And then we have a short run of ventricular tachycardia. And then sinus rhythm. And then atrial prematures and then atrial flutter. You can see it's not a random baseline, it's an organized sawtooth baseline. And there are some VPCs there as well. And then back into AF. We tried shocking this dog, this occurred in theater. We tried shocking this dog five, six times and every time it did this and we decided we've done our best, we're just gonna have to call it quits. So it's not always successful even on the day. So what do we do for dogs where it's not successful, or dogs where it's not suitable to even try cardioversion in the first place. Well, rate control is the answer. So ideally, before we start rate control treatment, we'd like a baseline halter, we'd like a 24 hour ECG. This is not practical in many cases out there. Um, and in those cases, perhaps the owner assessing heart rate uh, using either a smartphone ECG device, the uh, Alive Core or Cardia device could be useful. Or potentially, if you have an owner who's, you know, well-trained, if you like, they could monitor heart rate by palpating the thorax or even auscultating the basic stethoscope. There are possibilities there. The problem with that is we don't get to find out what the rhythm is doing. And you'll see why that might be important in a minute. So many dogs in the world won't get a halter because of cost and also availability. For me, this establishes the real need for heart rate control outside of hospital because heart rate in hospital is always higher than the heart rate it's going to get home. It will also let us look for ventricular arrhythmias. That might complicate treatment. There are some drugs I really do not want to use if there are frequent ventricular arrhythmias. And look at the stress effect. Every halter is like this, AF or not. The first hour or two or three, the heart rate's higher 
and it comes down as the halter progresses and the animal goes home and settles into the home environment. This is such a thing now that we will run all our halters for two days. And we tell the owners to take the halter off 24 hours after they get home, not after we put it on. So then when we analyze it, we can just take the last 24 hours and we just get rid of all that stress effect from our decision maker. This is what halters give you. You know, if you're monitoring dogs over time, you have this serial idea of what the heart rate's doing. And you can see I've marked on these two graphs that they're at the same scale. You can see this is the same dog two months apart on rate control treatment. On the left, the dog spends most of the day over 200 beats a minute. And actually on the, the second one, he comes down even lower than 90 when he's resting and doesn't even go above 200 at all. So there's quite a big difference. And this dog has a much better quality of life, exercise tolerance, and also probably a better prognosis with the heart rate more appropriately controlled using antiarrhythmic drugs. These are the sort of nasty things that we don't like finding, particularly on halters, are fast ventricular arrhythmias. Like on the right here, this is a couplet that's very closely coupled, very fast instantaneous rate between these two beats. And on the left here, we've got some complexity with ventricular bigeminy, so alternating VPC and supraventricular beats. These are both in dogs with atrial fibrillation. Sometimes we find something really interesting slash alarming and these are dogs uh, who've got atrial fibrillation and then something like third degree AB block. So here you can see the blue beats on the left are the fibrillatory, the atrial fibrillation beats and at the end it's in AF as well but in the middle we have a regular slow rhythm and that's atrial fibrillation with third degree AV block. Hard to identify because most of the time with third degree AV block we look for the non-conductive P waves but here of course there are no P waves, we just have a fibrillatory baseline. What gives it away is the abnormal complex morphology and the slow, regular rate. So here we've got a dog who's got conduction system disease as well as the atrial fibrillation. This dog was actually hypothyroid and was poorly controlled at the time. So this is something where we can look at the, the wider picture, the non-cardiac picture, and try and control its thyroid disease better and then reassess what's happening there. So how can we control the heart rate in atrial fibrillation? Well, as I said earlier, the AV node is the control point. Drugs that we would consider using, digoxin, is a, a nice drug in some ways. It has a very effective rate control. However, it is associated with quite a high rate of toxicity. It's not the easiest drug to use. Diltiazem is a little bit more forgiving. It's a little safer, if you like. But I find that alone, the rate control is variable. Some dogs respond very well, some dogs not so much. The dose I've written here is one to two milligrams per kilo every eight to 12 hours. That depends on the formulation. You can get longer acting formulations, medium release, sustained release, but also it depends on the dog. So these are cases where we'll start the diltiazem, see what happens on the halter. And if we find it looks like the rate control is good for eight hours, but the dog's on twice daily diltiazem, we'll increase that to three times a day. We also will often go in the two to three milligrams per kilo dose range. So we will increase it above that, but a starting dose of one to two is good. Amiodarone, it's quite a good drug for a number of arrhythmias. I don't love it for atrial fibrillation because it doesn't have profound rate control. Sometimes it can be effective. There is a dose dependent um, risk of gastrointestinal signs. Um, even at lower doses, you can have nausea, anorexia. There are issues with toxicity. The iodine in amiodarone is iodine. It contains iodine, so it can interact with the thyroid gland and it can cause hyper or even hypothyroidism. Um, in humans, it's associated with things like pulmonary interstitial fibrosis. I don't see any reports of that in dogs, but what I have seen is an idiosyncratic hepatotoxicity, which is not dose related. And it happened several months uh, after the dog had been on amiodarone the dog came in with, with jaundice and uh, an acute liver failure. We stopped the drug, treated the dog supportively, and they did fine and went home on a different antiarrhythmic protocol. We're not always so lucky. Sotalol and other beta blockers, great rate control. They work really well in the AV node. However, there is a heart failure risk with structural heart disease, which precludes many of our AF patients from receiving them. So when do we consider rate control? Well, as I said, before, identification of an inappropriately high heart rate, best done on a halter. Can we get away with using in-clinic ECG? This is a, a really important question, isn't it? And here we have 
comparison, uh, a study comparing ECG in hospital versus 24 hour halter for rate control with dogs with AF. So there were two key points of this paper that in-clinic ECG heart rate was consistently above the halter-derived heart rate. It makes sense, the stress, the catecholamines pushing the heart rate up in the clinic. It mimics what we see on the halters, they come down as they get home. They associated in this study that a heart rate over 155 beats a minute in the clinic was likely to be associated with poor home heart rate control. It's not great at all, however, what we could say is that a heart rate below 150 in the clinic probably means you've got reasonable rate control at home. You would have to contextualize that. You'd have to think, is the patient okay? Does the owner think the quality of life is good? Are the heart failure signs controlled, etc.? If the answer to those questions is no, well, maybe the heart rate is a problem despite what you're getting in the clinic. As I said, remember that stress effect. Heart rate is important. It's not just theoretical. It's not just about, do we think their cardiac output is lower? It's about their survival. Bridget Pedro and a group from Liverpool University uh, in collaboration with UPenn in the US looked at a large group of dogs with atrial fibrillation and what the effect of heart rate on a halter was on survival. We can see a survival curve here. So for those of you not familiar with survival curves, the y-axis represents the proportion of dogs who enrolled in the study that are alive. So at the start, it's 100%. And as time goes on, dogs die because of their atrial fibrillation, uh, because of their heart disease. So we've got two groups here. We've got the group of dogs with a heart rate below 125 and the group of dogs with a heart rate of 125 or more on halter. This is the 24 hour mean heart rate. We can see the higher heart rate group of dogs have a shorter survival time than the lower heart rate group of dogs. So it's not just theoretical, this is a real thing. It's a relatively small group of dogs, 46 dogs with AF, um, and about half of them are dead at the end of the study. However, this was a highly significant finding, and I think it mimics what I've seen in some of uh, the data that we've got, um, where I've sort of not published it, but played with the data looking at, at uh, heart rate in AF. We can see uh, in that data that the same thing is true. Higher heart rates are associated with a shorter survival time. So can we use in-clinic ECG over 160 to think about treating. Again, contextualize it. Ask the owner, how is the dog? What's the exercise like? What are you doing? How's the heart failure? Halter, that's what I use. That's the best thing we have, I think. Um, so if you do have access, that's the preferable strategy. What drugs do we reach for? Well, we could use digoxin, diltiazem, or both. Those are our go-to drugs for rate control in atrial fibrillation. There is Data out there supporting the use of both drugs over either alone. This is a small number of dogs, 18 dogs, but this was a randomized crossover trial. There's a lot that's good about the design of this study. However, there are a couple of things that are um, limitations of the study. And I think overall, it's not conclusive that a combination is required in every case. So should we start every dog with AF that needs rate control on both digoxin and diltiazem? I, I don't think we should. I think there is a place for it, but I think we can use one or the other initially. So how do we use digoxin? Digoxin is a cardiac glycoside derived from fox loves originally, like the digitalis compounds. It's, it's toxic. So we have to be very careful how we use it. So if we've got a dog with systolic dysfunction that's bad, or severe left atrial dilation. Digoxin is a really good go-to. It is not positively inotropic, but it's not negatively inotropic. And some higher doses of other drugs, especially beta blockers, are negatively inotropic. So digoxin is quite a safe drug from the cardiac output point of view, and it does provide effective rate control in many cases. However, we just want to watch the dose. I tend to calculate a dose based on five micrograms per kilogram. I don't like splitting the tablets, it just keeps it easier and we get nice even drug distribution through the tablet. So I calculate the nearest tablet size and then go down the tablet size basically. Calculate the nearest dose and go down. So for example, if we have a 40 kilo dog with atrial fibrillation, that dose would be 40 by five, 200 micrograms per dose. The tablets for digoxin come in 125 and 250. So for that case, I'd select 125 
because you work out the lower tablet size compared to what you need and use that as your starting dose. We always measure the serum digoxin level. That's in the trough of the pill. So six to eight hours post pill, we measure that around about a week after starting. If we get a measurement of 1.2 or above, sorry, above 1.2, that's too high for me. Just check your lab because some laboratories will say the dose range goes between 0 0.8 and 2. That's too high when you get to 2. They will be toxic at that level. We want it approximately 1. 0 0.8 to 1.2 is what we aim for to know we're giving enough to have an effect, but not too much to be toxic. If a dog who's receiving digoxin starts vomiting or becomes nauseous, stop the drug because that's a really solid sign of toxicity. So when do we use diltiazem? So we could start with digoxin alone, but if we measure that serum concentration and it's too high, then we could drop the digoxin dose or just stop it completely if we're worried about um, clinical signs of toxicity. Or we could add the um, diltiazem if we're having a poor uh, effect on rate control. So we tend to halt at two weeks, and if we've got inadequate rate control, we'll add diltiazem at two mg per kg twice a day, depending on the formulation. We normally use the, the um, medium or sustained release preps, and we'll adjust that dose to effect. If the digoxin concentration approximately 1, so 0 0.8 to 1.2, then we'll just adjust the diltiazem from then onwards. We won't adjust the digoxin because it's in the therapeutic range. We don't want to push too hard with that. If the digoxin measures low, so less than 0 0.8, you can probably increase the dose. Be careful using digoxin in dogs who are hypokalemic because it competes with potassium. So if you have low blood potassium, you'll end up in a situation where a, a normal dose of digoxin may become toxic. And also, you're dosing for lean body mass. If these patients have lots of pleural effusion or ascites, factor that into your calculations. If you have a dog de Bordeaux, guess they've got eight liters of ascites or you know six liters of ascites and work that out. Take six or eight kilos off their body weight when you're calculating it. If animals are really cachexic, the low muscle mass will also predispose to digoxin toxicity. So just beware using it in those cachectic, um, bad heart failure cases, especially if their electrolytes are a little bit screwed because their renal function is not as good as it should be. So if we can't use digoxin or diltiazem for some reason, or we don't have access to them, or we have a dog who has profound GI signs uh, on digoxin and not enough rate control on diltiazem, what else can we consider? Well, we can consider class two agents, the beta blockers, for example, atenolol. It can be very, very useful for rate control. However, if you have left atrial dilation or very poor systolic function, there is a risk that beta blockade in those patients will lead to the onset of congestive heart failure signs. If you're going to use this in patients at risk of heart failure, start low, go slow with your dose. So start at the low end, slowly increase the dose to a therapeutic effect. We could consider class three agents, the potassium channel blockers, for example, amiodarone we already mentioned. It's not great heart rate control uh, by itself, but if you have a halter like I've showed you with very severe ventricular arrhythmias, using digoxin can actually make those ventricular arrhythmias worse because it causes cells to become calcium loaded and excessive calcium in the cell can cause little sparks that trigger ventricular arrhythmias. So if we have a dog with atrial fibrillation, poor heart rate control and ventricular arrhythmias, we could consider using amiodarone because maybe it's safer than using digoxin. So in summary, atrial fibrillation can be diagnosed in isolation. The proportion of those wolfhounds never developed significant heart disease. So maybe we can call those isolated AF. However, it's hard to know at the time because with a normal echo, half of those dogs may go on to develop cardiomyopathy phenotype. So we still don't know if AF is the trigger or the result of the heart disease. These are cases that I would consider for cardioversion. High heart rates in AF are associated with poor prognosis. The higher the heart rate at home, the shorter the survival time. Halter monitoring is the most useful decision-making tool for these patients to look at heart rate 
but also to look for concurrent arrhythmias and things that may influence our treatment decision. Rate control versus rhythm control. It can be a contentious issue. We know that electrical cardioversion can benefit selected patients, especially patients where they've had AF associated with general anesthesia. However, if you have a dog with structural heart disease, they are not suitable for uh, rhythm control. We have to anesthetize them, that's a risk. We put them through that and charge the money to the client and actually they might just come back in, in the next month with atrial fibrillation all over again. So rate control is the best strategy for those patients. And home heart rate assessment is an important part of decision making, even if you don't have access to a halter. Think about the in-clinic ECG, think about any heart rates the owner can, can get at home, but also think about the context. How is the dog? What does the owner think about the dog's quality of life? <coughs> so thank you very much for listening and um, for, for joining us for this little tour, this safari of atrial fibrillation in dogs. Uh, I think we can bring order to chaos and even if your decision making felt chaotic before with your anti-arrhythmic choices, maybe there's some order and structure to that now. I wanted to share with you just at the end, two highlights of Bristol where I live. Uh, on the right there, we have the Clifton Suspension Bridge and some of the old uh, waterfront. Um, it, you know, it's a beautiful place, especially when the sky is nice and blue. On the left there, we have the fantastic street art that we see in Bristol, these huge murals that really give the place a, a character. So if anyone wants to see any more interesting cardiology stuff or street art or photos of Bristol, then at vet underscore cardio underscore is my handle. Is that what people say? I should probably learn that um, on Instagram. So if you want to have a look at that, please do. I don't make any money from it. There's no conflict of interest. Um, and I'm happy to, to chat and take any questions now. Thank you very much. Well, 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 Kieran, excellent, <laughs> excellent talk. I I have enjoyed it a lot, and I'm sure we had really many, many of you following Kieran webinar, and uh, I, I'm I'm pleased. We are pleased for that, and really, Thanks, thank Diana. you so much. Thank you, uh, but don't forget uh, the reason why we are all here. We are. Uh, join our forces to raise uh, funds uh, to send them over via the Red, uh, the British Red Cross to Ukrainian um, people. So it's an, you, actually what we are doing is uh, something very important, uh, humanitarian, humanitarian uh, action, and we are using our tools uh, to do that. Uh, and Kieran has... Uh, amazing, excellent tools, and he can, you know, uh, he can talk for sure. Is uh, Kieran? I'm, I'm impressed, and yeah. So because That's I'm a, I, never, I never follow cardiology talks, but uh, uh, it's a pleasure to <laughs> to listen to you. Is uh, double boarded now, Daniela. Double boarded. You can. Uh, <laughs> Not for sure. So cardiology is not my cup of tea, but at least you have brought some light into this oh. darkness for, for me as a surgeon. So so please click on the www.justforgiving um, slash vets for Ukraine and make oh. your own donation. A little bit helps and makes a big difference. Yes, Kieran, you wanted to say something? Oh no, I was just pointing at the hashtag that's yeah, 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 exactly. So um and again if you can um use the money that you would spend for a coffee or anything else that you like cigarettes just for one just one off time, just donate and help us uh for uh to help Ukraine. So I think we need to wait. Uh, hi, Eri Erika. Erika is a, as an intern that is uh, following us basically nearly every day. Hi, Erika. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome back. And before, because um, we, I would like to see whether there are questions, but usually we need Oh, there, there we are. <laughs> so usually we need time to have questions, but we have already marked Marcus stepped up when we needed him. Yeah, so can you read the question? Do you read it on the screen? Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. So thanks, Marco, for the, the question, for reaching out. So do you think that the lack of thrombotic events in dogs with AF is due to the fact that most of them have mitral regurgitation, either due to myxomatous mitral biopsies or DCM, which may avoid creating slow blood flow in the left atrium? Yeah, that could be part of it. Yeah. So what Marco is referring to is that um, if we think about cats with cardiomyopathy, they have atrial dilation, poor atrial function, and they develop spontaneous echo contrast and, and micro thrombi within the atria, uh, normally the left atrium, uh, which can develop a thrombus in situ. And we associate the, the thrombus formation largely to changes in contractile function of the atrium. So a lack of movement of blood, stagnation of blood flow. Oftentimes those cats haven't got bad mitral valve, uh, sorry, bad regurgitation through the mitral valve. And if we think about dogs who have uh, mitral regurgitation, it's hugely turbulent. So even with a big atrium, it mixes that blood. And therefore that mixing of the blood means that it's more likely to circulate around the body, get diluted, by um, all those uh, antithrombotic factors that are secreted by the endothelium in the capillaries and, and elsewhere. So it, it's a really um, nice hypothesis that actually bad mitral regurgitation is protective against thrombotic events. The answer to your question, Marco, I guess is that um, we, we can't prove anything either way. Um, I quite like the idea that it's a protective thing. I do think also there's just species differences. Um, and, you know, I, I think dogs are much less likely to, to clot abnormally than cats are. Um, cats have got quite a high platelet count relative to, um, to dogs. So I think there are other factors too. Um, but you know, there are lots of small factors probably playing a part. And I agree with you. Uh, well, I don't know what your opinion is, but your question hints that, that you might believe might, that uh, mitral regurgitation is protective. And I think it might be, yeah. Thank you, Suzanne. So, uh, Petra, hi, thank you. <laughs> so, let's see. Uh, another question here, Farzin. Mm. Thanks, Farzin. Um, nice to hear from you. Um, so, uh, have you encountered in myxomatous mitral valve disease a dog where the rhythm is controlled with digoxin and diltiazem? Um, Fazim saw one recently and it was a weird one for him. Yeah, I, I've, you know, the context I've seen that actually, <clears throat> and I've seen it maybe three, four times now, um, is in Dobermans with DCM and AF. Um, and they, they present heart failure and atrial fibrillation. And we treat them, uh, you know, aggressively for the heart failure. So we treat them with pimabendin and um, ferrosamide. And I'm guessing that your dog was also treated with pimabendin and ferrosamide. Um, or maybe you intensified frozen mind therapy um, around that time, because my belief is that there's no rationale for why digoxin or diltiazem should restore sinus rhythm in terms of their, their actions. They work on the AV nodes. They don't work on the atrial cells in the same way. I acknowledge calcium channel blockers will work a little on that, but they won't do things to the refractory period, which is how things like amiodarone and, um, and sodium channel blockers will work. So my belief when I've seen it happen is that we've actually shrunk the atrial size, reduced the atrial stretch by treating the heart failure aggressively, and the animal comes back in and they're, or the next morning or something, they're in sinus rhythm, and we think, oh, it's the antiarrhythmic drugs. I, it's probably not. It's probably the dynamics of what's happening in the atrium uh, and your um, treatment reducing volume loading um, of the atrium. But I mean, there may be contributing factors, especially from diltiazem. Thank you, Kieran. Whilst we are waiting for other questions, I would like to remind uh, the marathon that we are organizing for tomorrow, Saturday and Sunday. So three days, 15 speakers, 28 hours, 28 hours of free CPD, uh, which will be released at uh, certain times that you can see. Um, and these are all the uh, talks that we have had until now. We started, I think, on the 16th 
um, of March, and and today is the 15th uh, webinar, and we they will uh, go in streaming again from tomorrow. So they are recorded on on our Facebook group and on uh, on YouTube. You can watch them on demand. But from tomorrow, there will be the marathon, and you can choose and pick up the one that you like. And and obviously, um, if you um, follow, if you watch one of our webinars, please donate and uh, give your contribution. I must say, uh, Kieran, that today um, we have had um, uh, loads of people donating and I thank you because I think it's 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 great because because of your presence here. And it's, a, it's a team effort, isn't it? Something like this and, and yeah. I think everyone needs to pull together and, and you know, if everyone does a little bit, then the effect is big. Yeah, many people are interested in cardiology. Cardiology is a topic that interests because, you know, it can be very, very useful in everyday practice. Um, and, and therefore, now I will launch my challenge to you. So okay. as we have done for Professor Stein uh, Niss, uh, Nissen, then I would oh, yeah. say if you like, if you love Kieran as I do, um, and we want to, certainly we would like to see him again and we would like to have you back at some point, maybe in, in, uh, in some, some weeks. And if you are happy to do that, then sure. please people on the other side of the camera, just send us messages and, and just let us know. We will have him back, but you have to donate. So we want you to donate to- uh, Or if they never want to see me again. You know, make a big donation. <laughs> oh, you want <laughs> But if you want to see, we will see again uh, Stein and we will see again for sure. Uh, if you are happy, obviously I don't want to force you, Kieran. No, I'd be very but, happy to, yeah. It's but all, all please good donate, calling. donate, donate, because you yeah. it's a win-win. So uh, we get the money for the people in difficulty in Ukraine and you get... Um, some of the precious knowledge and expertise of Kiran um, to take home. So it's really a win-win. And therefore, um, yes, we have Evelina with another question. Yeah, thanks, Evelina. Um, so what sedation protocol do you use for electrical cardioversion? We, we uh, anesthetize them um, because it's quite a big shock and there's a lot of muscle movement at the things, which could be quite distressing unless they're, um, you know, really, uh, unconscious um so we will uh now my if i have an anesthetist watching my anesthetist will be saying he doesn't know what he's doing um but we we tend to sedate them as a pre-med before the anesthetic uh with an opiate so something like methadone um and uh and then for the um, anesthesia itself uh, a reasonable induction agent i think would be something like propofol or faxalone um, just given slowly um, and then um, we just need to make sure they've got adequate depth of anesthesia during the procedure. Uh, the maintenance is normally isoflurane or sevoflurane. Um, these are dogs, remember, that you know don't have heart muscle disease, don't have bad mitral regurgitation, so they're not terrible anesthesia candidates. Um, you know, it's just the rhythm that's abnormal uh, for most of these guys. Um, so yeah, so I, I, we tend to use a fairly standard um, anesthetic approach. We will give them um, some paracetamol uh, intravenously, post um, cardioversion or post um, shock, uh, and combine that with the methadone. Hopefully, that reduces any discomfort they might have. I believe it causes some muscle ache um, afterwards. It's not hugely painful, but you know, it's not like surgery. But I think they are a little bit sore. So just make sure they've got some post-op paracetamol for 24 hours. Yes. Uh, thank you again, Evelina, for your question. So I just wanted to uh, highlight one fact that probably we have not mentioned clearly. So Kieran is from, as he mentioned during his presentation, is from the vet school in Bristol. Uh, we will have also um, another uh, lecturer with us who is Sore Langley Hobbs and she's an orthopedic from Bristol and I would like to acknowledge here really the uh, great contribution of our colleagues in the vet schools uh, in the UK so we have had uh, a few days ago we have had Kelly, Kelly Blacklock from Edinburgh and we have uh, really uh, 
a good number of representatives from the RVC, from the Euro Veterinary College. Um, we have had Sandra. Uh, we will have. Um, I take now the the actually the occasion to uh, anticipate the next uh, webinar that will be on the 14th. So we have nearly a week because today is the seventh. Yes, in a week time, we will have uh, we will have Professor, Professor Vicky Lipscomb, and um, uh, she is a, a surgeon. She's a specialist soft tissue surgeon, and she will talk about uh, wound closure tips and tricks. And we have other many representatives from the universities and from the Royal College of other universities. So uh, Jane Ladlow from uh, Cambridge. So amazing contribution from, from uh, the vet schools, EU, uh, British and also European, because we will have, if I don't remember wrong, Simona Vincenti, another soft tissue surgeon from Bern. Um, and we will have also someone from Vienna, if uh, if uh, she will find, she she's definitely, uh, she wants to take part, we just need to define the, the dates. Um, we will have Dan Brockman, we will have Matteo Rossanese from the RVC, uh so really thank you guys uh for your um for your your contribution from the university from the vet schools because uh also you you know, you have many vet students that can take part to the, these uh webinars and it's always something uh, to learn and to take home. Um other questions, Paolo? Do we have other questions for Kieran? I don't see any other questions. Uh, yes, yeah, so then uh, one of the last things that I would like to remind is this. So the Make Your Own T-shirt, that's for Ukraine 2022. So we have la launched this initiative to make uh, to, to try to uh, make you feeling more participative. So make your own t-shirt, a white t-shirt, any color is good, a black pen, marker pen, yellow, blue, whatever you like, and then and take a photo uh, and, and send it or publish to your on your uh, social media or send it to us. I think the the some students in the university of milan are trying to do that in a group and we are waiting for their photo um yes so i think make your own t-shirt um i need to try harder for next time don't i i think <laughs> i think that's this is perfectly <laughs> it's good that oh, that's yeah yeah um do you want to would you like to do your own appeal again before I let you go? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, so thanks to everybody who's, um, well, who's tuned in this evening um, and, and stayed watching. I know it may be late on, um, but also, um, you know, to all the people who will share the, the whole initiative of Vets for Ukraine um, on their socials and to their colleagues, to students, um, don't forget to use the hashtag and, and make sure to try and share the link for donations. Um, you know, we've got a war happening here on our doorstep in Europe and, and uh, a, humanitarian, a humanitarian crisis is, is happening right in front of us. Um, we've all got to do whatever we can. And I think even small efforts put together mean that we're going to see big change for people. Um, and, you know, after this is all over, as I said earlier, you know, it's not just in the Ukraine, it's worldwide. Uh, and I think there's more that we can all do to try and help our fellow human beings. On uh, one last thing, I would like to thank thank your wife uh, Tash as well, uh, because uh, I have to name my wife. She's amazing. She's amazing. Exactly, because Tash has, is working uh, behind the scenes and she's uh, sharing uh, the links of our webinars to all, our, all the interns and residents um, of the institutions where the, many of the speakers uh, are working for. So thank you, Tash. So, and you can also, uh, Kiran, uh, um, uh, thank her on, on I'll that. Pass on. She's working right now. She, uh, she's, she's just, you know, for the I cause. Bet. I bet. <laughs> but, and I think um, I, we don't have any further questions for you, but... Uh, if anyone just, has questions, if they think of something, you can always reach out to me on, uh, on, you know, on Instagram or, or whatever is absolutely fine. So thanks for tuning in, guys.
Yeah. So thank you, Kira, for being with us. It was a you, great, really, so great to have you to see you again. Uh, amazing talk. Uh, a really precious contribution. But you thank know, you. we will come back to you. We will want you. Uh, back with us and don't forget tomorrow the marathon will start and um, yes tash is the best yes we know <laughs> and, a screenshot that for her because uh she's going to be very happy so. yeah, absolutely so uh www.justgiving.com slash rest for ukraine is the link to click on to make your own donation uh every little help so you can give one euro one pound because you know uh this one euro might be nothing for us but it's a lot for uh, someone that hasn't got clean water or hasn't got uh, a blanket or a roof where to sleep uh, below so please help us helping them and thank you so much and good night thank you kiran bye bye <laughs> bye bye thank you <laughs>